All right, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Matthew 17, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Matthew 17, in the first verse, the Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto a high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tab if thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of, uh, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and said, Arise. Be not afraid. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. And Lord, we thank you uh, for this little church, Lord, that you allow us to stand true. God, we thank you uh, for all the blessings that you've given us. We pray with brother, for Brother Junior this morning that you would continue to heal his body. And Lord, we pray uh, for our brethren who are preaching this morning that you would give them grace where they're at. We'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, very familiar verses of Scripture um, and the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this is probably the most glorious account of a transfiguration because they saw him in a, a spiritual light that few were able to see him in. But on the very same token, he was seen in other forms before this occasion, and after this occasion, he manifested himself in, in different ways. And our Lord Jesus Christ has that ability, uh, not only physically, but spiritually. And I guess how you see Jesus this morning is what I'm asking you about. And I don't mean that he changes his motto and he changes his method, but you know, at times, Jesus has been my only answer. Uh, when things were down and there was nothing left to do, Jesus was my only answer. When I didn't have enough food to feed my family, Jesus was the only answer. I saw him in that life. I, I saw him when spiritually I had no chance, and he was the only answer. Mm. Uh, I've seen him uh, high and lifted up. Uh, the, you know, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah, he saw him in a brand new way that day in the temple that he'd never seen him before. And he changed his life dramatically after that. Uh, he's an answer to problems. He's the center of our praise. We can see him in so many different ways. And the question, it is, the, the question I have for you this morning is how do you see him today? And, and there's not necessarily right or wrong in any of them as long as you see him in the light of God, in the light of the Word of God, that you see him for who he is. Now, I'm going to look back on our text very quickly, and after six days, and, and the six days preceding this, there's a couple of things going on. First of all, and most memorable, in Matthew 16, uh, the apostle Peter looks on the Lord Jesus Christ and says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. You know what? That, that's a revelation that comes from God and not by you. You think about that, and I, I don't know if this was uh, uh, Peter's salvation experience. I personally think it was. I think he traveled with the Lord Jesus Christ for a year and a half and didn't even know who he was dealing with. And then at that point, he says this, Thou art the Christ. And that he saw him in a new light. He saw him in, as the answer to sin. He saw him as the only saving factor that could be. 
And you remember the Lord Jesus Christ answered to that, Blessed art thou, Simon and Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, he saw him in a new light. Uh, how do you see Christ this morning? So a week later, we see that the inner circle, Peter, James, and uh, <laughs> Uh, Peter, James, and, and uh, excuse me, James, John, and Peter got to see him in different light. Uh, as glorious as he really was, uh, as the man, the, Lord, the, the very God of heaven in his man form, they were going to get to see him. You know, a lot of times we never behold God like that. You know, uh, sad but true, I found it. When we see when we see him like that is most of the time when we need something. Mm -hmm. that, that, that we see his real capabilities. You know, I dare say this, most people never really behold what God is able to do. Why did he cross the Red Sea? Was it just for the safety of the children of Israel? I don't think that's necessarily do, uh, true. I think he displayed himself as God. And the older I get, and I think this is typical for the Christian, the more I want to see him for all that he is. Remember what Moses' one desire was? He said, I want to see him. He was up on the mountain with him, and he said, no man can see me and live. But you know what? That wasn't something that he was concerned about. I believe Moses was willing to trade off. Yeah, I'll die if I can just see you. And, and so... Many times we miss the boat, and you know, I really say what's wrong with our Sovereign Grace Baptist churches, and why we tiptoe around the subject of worship, is not so much that we're ashamed to do it, although I think that's a piece of it, but I think the big thing is we don't see him as God, so there's nothing to worship. If he's not everything and you're all in all, you know, well, and we'll read that in a minute, but what a wonderful statement, I am. He said, when, when Moses went before him, he said, what do I say? And he was talking about to God's own people, not, not to the Egyptians. He said, what, what, is I, what do I say to my own people? He said, tell them I am. Said, yeah. I am. That means I'm everything. That means I always will be. That, that, that's a being, what we call when I was in elementary school, a being verb. What a wonderful way to describe the God of the Bible. It's just I am. He is. He's a being. He, he always has been and always will be. That's how he wanted to be described. And so after this wonderful manifestation of the, of the answer to sin, the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, six days later, he takes Peter up for another event. Verse 2, and was transfigured before them. In other words, his, uh, I, I think it's in the gospel of Mark, it said his visage was changed. Mm -hmm. how, how, how he looked and presented. Now, you know, today, <clears throat> It's almost blasphemous when we think, you know, uh, about how the Lord is presented as the long-haired hippie. Mm -hmm. that, that is not the, the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. You know what? We're fixing to go into the Christ mask, big season, Catholic hero. You know what? Christ is not in that manger. Right. And what they said is a manger and what we... You know what it really was where they went, that little cute stable you see in the nativity? They were mostly caves in that day. It, it was nothing like, uh, we have a little stable where Shakuro stays. That's nothing like the stable of the Christ. Uh, and all that set aside, you know, you know, I fully believe this. They do it to foul up our, our understanding of God. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not on the cross. You know, the older I get, the more I see of this horrifically beaten man hanging on the cross. Listen, dear friend, he's not there no more. Mm -hmm. He's miraculous. He, he's done with that. But yet, and see, you see Catholics again, and not even just Catholics anymore. Uh, you see people proclaiming to uh, understand the Bible, presenting the Lord Jesus Christ.
Christ that way. He's not there. Right. He, he's not in that. He's not in that situation anymore. And, and so he's transfigured. The visage of the person of who he is. The visage changes before them, and it says, "And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light." So he he had this unbelievable, overshadowing, overshadowing brightness about him. And if you remember uh, in, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, that's how he's described again as light. Mm -hmm. uh, and light is energy. And light is life. And if it wasn't light, we could grow nothing. We could do nothing. If it wasn't light, we would freeze to death in a very, very short amount of time. And, and so being light is being life. And he said, and, and so he manifests himself in this beautiful, unbelievable way. And if you remember the, the event I spoke of with Moses in his life, it says after that event that Moses shined from that day forward. Mm. And he had that presence about him. And, and so he manifests himself, transfigures before them, verse 3, and, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha talking with him. Now, I don't know why this happened, and it really isn't, uh, I don't know if there is any significance. I've heard all kinds of crazy things about why these two people appeared uh, before them, and after 30 years of study, I've come down to this. I don't know why, but I know that they did. I don't know their significance. Some people says it was the law and the prophets, and some people says it was going to be people that would live again, all kinds of foolishness like that. But this is the this is the thing. Number one, they were all they were somewhere too, and by that I mean they are. God is eternal in the fact that He's always been and always will be. But listen, mankind goes on and on somewhere as well, and. By this point, Moses had been dead over close to 3,000 years, and he still was. Elijah had probably been dead for 2,000 years, and he still was. And, and listen, redeemed or lost, you'll go on and on somewhere, so you better make the calling and election sure. Mm -hmm. Just like these two individuals, all mankind is eternal. You know, that's really the... The, the thing about denying God is not so much the issue. Uh, what people who are in that camp want to do is deny their, their, their uh, uh, accountability to God. It's not so much that they want to deny God, they want to deny their accountability to it. Because if, if poof, we're done and this life's over, then you have nothing to worry about, right? Well, dear friend, let me tell you this, you have a lot to worry about. Yeah. You have a lot to be concerned about. And, and, and so we find that they, these two men come on the scene and, and really verify what's occurring here. Verse 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, I want you to see, uh, and, and, and younger in my ministry, I would get down on Peter a whole lot. Now, Peter didn't have much control of his tongue, and yet still I don't either. But I do want you to see this. Uh, he wanted to say something. Uh, you know, first of all, sometimes the best thing we do is keep our mouth shut. <laughs> and that's a, that's a hard thing for me to do. But he did see the significance of what was happening. He was getting to see things that only angels dream of looking into. It, 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 it was remarkable to him. So he said the first thing that popped into his mind. Not necessarily a praiseworthy thing. And we'll find that the Almighty God in heaven, Jehovah, corrects him for his line of thought. But he does say something. Verse 5. And while he, meaning Peter, yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now that finished any contradiction, any kind of challenges that uh, Jewish, uh, that Peter's Jew Jewishness bellowed up within him, and it ended with Christ is the only one. Now, 
Remember this, it showed that he, it, he it manifested himself, I understand this correctly, as light and as a cloud. Now, that ought to sound familiar to God's people because that's how the Jewish people were always led in their journey from Egypt to the land of promise. Always, always with those two beings, it's how they were led. So those three Jewish boys there knew exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. They, they, they understood specifically what it was saying. And the rest of it was gone, and Jesus became the emphasis. Uh, you know what? Who should be the emphasis, the leading movement in your life? It should be the Lord Jesus Christ. What's his will for you? Individually, corporately, as a church, what is his will in your life? And I think that uh, finding the perfect will, and I, I've said this for years, and there's a brother down in Henry County uh, on the Henry, on the Carroll County side. Uh, we've been talking since Adam was 16, so you know how long ago that's been. And uh, he called me, and he says, I've heard you to preach, I've heard you to preach for years about the perfect will and the permissive will of God. Now, the perfect will of God is when you find it, and whatever it is, whatever cost it takes, whatever friendships you have to break, you stand in the perfect will of God, and the permissive will is everything else. Uh, just because you attend church does not mean you're in the perfect will of God. Just because you enjoy sound preaching does not mean you're in the perfect will of God. And we find here that, the, that these three men... <laughs> understand and for a moment kiss the perfect will of God because they understand what's happening. Verse 6, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And I think it's because they understood the gravity of the situation. They understood that they had just heard from the Almighty. And in verse 7, and Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. Now that's a that's a very a very large request, and we don't get it because we're so we're so numbed by this world that we don't understand what being in the presence of the Almighty is about. But the reason these people were so alarmed and, and, and so taken back, they had heard the mighty God of all heaven, Jehovah audibly speak and it put them on their feet it put them on the, it put them on their face and, and so when he says be not afraid that was a mouthful to say and then if you uh, if you know the rest of this text for time's sake we won't go through it but uh, he said uh, he said uh, tell no one now, if you'd heard the Almighty God Jehovah speak, I don't know about you, but it'd be hard for me not to tell somebody. And he says, tell no one. And the reason why, there were some things left to do. Now, go with me now to the Gospel of John. And if you've seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his beauty, even if the answer to your sin, you've seen more than many. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. Gospel of John chapter 8. And we're just going to read a couple of verses here. Uh, beginning in verse 57, John chapter 8 and uh, uh, verse 57, the Bible says, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham uh, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now there's the very verse, uh, part of the accounting I told you about earlier. I am. I'm the being. I always have been and I always will be. Now, what, what that said to the Jews was blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Because he was claiming to be God. Mm -hmm. He was claiming to be that God man. And they didn't see it. You know, all the, all, all the things that the Jews did under Christ, and he, he went through these things, was, was amazing. And you wonder how someone could be so stupid. Well, we'll see in just a minute why they never saw him. They never saw him for who he was. They never saw him for what he was. They never saw him in his divine purpose. They never saw any of that 
But notice verse 59. And they took up stones to cast at him. In other words, they were going to stone him out. They were going to kill him. And they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, that's a complicated sentence, but it said that he hid himself. And I don't think he was doing like this, traveling around the crowd like this. I think he disappeared. Mm -hmm. See, he can manifest himself that way. He can just be gone in a moment's time. And, and, and doesn't have to. Yeah, have you ever looked at people and, and wondered, why is that individual not concerned about eternity? Mm. Have you ever looked at someone and said, why can't they see the wonderful person of Christ? The very same reason right there. He hid it. The Bible literally says he hid himself from them. And if you've seen Christ this morning, rejoice, rejoice ye greatly. Because that's not any, that, that, that's not a small thing. You look, you look at the world that we live in, and you sometimes just shake your head and say, how can these things be? Well, we just remember this. They've not seen him. They've not seen him who he is. They've not seen him as a sacrifice. They've not seen him in his majesty. They've seen not, none of that. So if you had never seen the merit of Christ and who he is, you would be in the same way. You, you would do the exact same things. You would present the exact same way. And, and so we find then, it's at the Lord Jesus' good pleasure, whom he will allow himself to be seen by, and conversely, who he hides himself from. And that is, um, that is an amazing thing to me. Uh, you know, how precious our salvation is, and we don't even really know it. Mm. Uh, uh, I was uh, watching this video on my phone the other night. I like murder mysteries. And this gentleman had just done horrible, horrible things to three different women. One of them just a little girl about seven years old. About Bella's size. And like, uh, how could that be? And just before his death, the Lord saved him, or he said he did. Take it for what it's worth. And this was his statement, I can't believe what I've done. That seems pretty genuine to me, don't you? I can't believe what I've missed. And you know what, that, that's, that's an opening of an eye. Seeing the situation for what it is. And that doesn't happen for, er, for, any, for, for everyone that there is. It only happens for his people. And if you have that this morning, and you've enjoyed seeing Christ for who he is, it ought to be on your heart to praise him. The Gospel of Luke. Uh, I, I refer to this uh, section of Scripture frequently, but we want to read it this morning, and you're hearing the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke 24, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, had given the sacrifice, and we're at the morning of the resurrection. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, beginning in verse three, uh, 13. Luke 24 and verse 13, the Bible says, And behold, two of them, meaning the disciples, not the apostles, but two believers, two ones of ones that followed Christ, and behold, two of them went the same day, meaning the day that the women said, We've seen the Lord, to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. You know, that's a, that's a very powerful verse, isn't it? Yeah. You, you know who sees Christ? The ones he manifests himself to. Now, I personally believe, and you that have more study the Bible than me can, can clear me out on it, but I don't think this happens anymore. 
I think this was the 40 day period before his ascension back to glory. And he manifest himself this way. But on the flip side of this, I, I will say this, we've entertained angels unaware. Like that brother you were talking about earlier, that was a good thing you did because we have no idea who these people are. Uh, we have no idea, no idea they come in our life and they're gone like that, never see them again. He, you know, rejoice in that. And, and so he comes down, he meets them on the road to Emmaus, and he begins to speak with them. And they don't know who he is. That, that's a phenomenal thing to me. They, they lived and worked with him for three years, and he hid himself from them. Uh, that should make our salvation more and more precious, that, that they're in the midst. He, he was in the midst of them, and they, they did not see him for who he was. They did not understand that they were speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, the Bible says, And he said unto them, what manner of communication are they are these that you have not uh, that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Now, I want you to see your view of events in your life or everything. Because remember, Mary had already run from the the tomb and said, "I've seen the Lord." And remember, he he he. He, she had his back to him and thought he was the gardener. And he made one simple word, Mary. And immediately she knew who he was. See, she'd had that experience and tried to share it with others. You, you ever tried to, and, and what I found through witnessing down through the years, instead of throwing the five points at him, just tell him what he's done for you. Uh, I found that to go a lot further. And... Uh, so we, we find then that this, this, this uh, two individuals didn't know who he was. Walked with him, talked with him, and still didn't recognize him. And uh, often I feel like we, we spend the majority of our lives that way. And often again, we take our own perception of the situation wrong. Now, can you imagine... Well, what would you have done? And, and, you know, men in that day thought they were far superior to women. And that they, uh, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, the Bible says that they're what they said seemed as idle tales. But would you rejoice at the note of a woman telling you Christ is alive? I know you, you saw him beaten. I know you saw him on the cross. I know you saw him die. But Christ is alive. Would you rejoice? Or would they be idle tales? And, and the, these individuals had marked it up as idle tales. They were going back to business. They were going down to Emmaus. They were doing their own thing. And they were discussing the events. And Christ comes among them. And they don't even know who he is. Go down to verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them... In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and break and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Mm. Man, you talked amazing, amazing thing. And, and he 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 breaks this before him. Some people say that it was they were observing the Lord's Supper. I disagree because they had no wine. Uh, or at least it's not mentioned. I believe he was literally fixing them something to eat and serving them as his office was in that day. And they recognized him and manifested him and boom, he vanished from their side. So in one second, 
He manifested him from servant. He manifested himself from servant to Christ to God in that quick. And then I love, I love the rest of that. Uh, he says, did the two, the two, the two brethren were talking and said, did our hearts not burn when he was with us? And, and they were so excited they ran back to Jerusalem to tell him. See, uh, they saw Christ for who he was, did they not? Yeah. How, you know, I don't want to serve, I, I don't want to view Christ as a feeble Christ, do you? I, I don't want to view Christ as someone that's in need of my help. I don't want to view Christ as someone who, who doesn't have it under his control. But I want to view Christ that everything is under his feet. Mm -hmm. That 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 despite what's bre what's breaking loose around us, I serve a God that not only is he control of it, but rather it's part of his plan. It's part of what he decided for me. Now go with me to the gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Mark 16. very end of Mark's gospel counting, Mark 16 and verse 6. And, he's, and he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. This was the angel. Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, whom was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, they were looking for Jesus. That, that's more than most today. And, and, you know, that's really where we are defined from primitive Baptist people. There's nothing wrong with seeking the Lord. Right. Uh, primitive Baptist people would tell you that's an impossibility. Well, I don't agree with them because the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't know him, this morning, sincerely seek him and, and look for him and desire him, that, that is what the Bible teaches us to do. And so these women having an inbuilt desire from God Almighty went down to the cemetery and was looking for Christ and they couldn't find him. They couldn't find him bodily. They couldn't find where he was at. And... Uh, <laughs> The graveyard, uh, I mean, the, the angel came to him. Uh, and you know what? I don't think this angel was, you know, your wings and stuff, the foolishness of the Catholic Church and a little ring around his head. I don't know what an angel looks like, uh, except that I know I've entertained him unaware. Mm -hmm. But I do know this. <laughs> he said, come and see where the place the Lord lay. So one thing I do know, I know where Jesus is not. He's not in that tomb. He's not in that crypt. He's, he's not sealed up anymore. And uh, because he's God, he rose for a purpose. And that purpose was to redeem his people. Now, so don't ever look at the Lord Jesus Christ as a being that's still in the tomb. Now, after our Christ mass here in a few days, there won't be long that uh, the Dollar General will be coming out with their eggs and their crosses and all that junk that they put out, and, and, and we'll be ready for Easter. Listen, he's not in the tomb. He's gone. And uh, so we know whatever Jesus is in your life this morning, he is not there. That is not the place uh, he belongs. Acts chapter 7, and I, I read this very frequently in your hearing. I never want you to forget it because uh, I don't know if it'll be now or if it'll be much later, but each and every one of us, separate and apart of the Lord's return, are going to face death. Uh, death is reality that must be looked at, and it needs to be looked at very carefully. It needs to be looked at with some consideration because it's, it, it's coming on each of us. And the same thing happened to Stephen. Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 56. Acts chapter 7, verse 56. Uh, the Bible says, uh, well, well, we'll pick up 
um, 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, uh, you know, you don't come through situations like uh, Stephen is about to running on empty. You know what laying out a church will do to make you run on empty? You know what not studying the Word of God personally will do to your life? It'll make you run on empty. And, and we see here that Stephen was not in that situation at all, but, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now I ask you, who is the glory of God? Jesus. You don't believe that? First Corinthians 11. It, it will teach you very clearly uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the glory of God. So he looks up and, and sees him, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, meaning Stephen, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So I'll give you an assurity of one place he is this morning, and that is at the, that he's sitting on the right hand of his Father. The Bible says this, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. That, that's a wonderful truth, is it not? When I mess up, and I do so frequently, all he says is, he's mine. Mm -hmm. He belongs to me, he's not much, but he's mine. I give my life's blood for him. And the Lord God, well done. Well done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's an amazing thing. And when I mess up so badly, and present so badly, and seem so vile, I have to remember that, that he's standing at the right hand of the Father, and it says he liveth to make intercession for me. Mm -hmm. Now, does he still come here? I don't know. I have to say, I truly don't know. He could if he wanted to, because being God, he's ever present. He could be in a million places all at the same time. So definitely it's within his realm. But I do know this right now, even this morning, he's still at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. And he is still saying, he's a mess up, but he belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And that's all it takes. Can, can you imagine satisfying with the Father? I told all my children when they were growing up, you just be honest with me. I might not be happy with you, but you be honest with me. Mm -hmm. And the best I know, my children have always done that. And, uh, Mostly, it was Matthew, not that he was any worse than the rest of them. But Matthew would start his statements like this. Dad, I know you're going to be mad, but. And then he'd tell me what he did. And I said, well, son, I'm not pleased, but I'm glad you told me. And then the fellowship was renewed. You, you know what you need, however you need Christ this morning, is you need good fellowship with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. when uh, we're offensive to him and our behavior is so much of the time we need we need restored fellowship you know what's wrong with our churches they're dry, they're cold, they're indifferent to the word of God uh, we need restored fellowship, that's the problem not only as individuals but as church groups you know uh, Bible, I, I think sometimes we forget what the Bible teaches about the church. It said we are fitly joined together. That means what I do impacts you. As Lord Jesus Christ was speaking of the church in his own ministry, he said, he, he talked about it as one body fitly joined together and talked about the use of the foot and the hands and the eyes. And said one can't do it alone. And sometimes I think we anticipate that of our pastor, don't we? Just, he's got, he's got it. He prays, he prays enough for all of us. Well, let me assure you, I don't. <laughs> uh, and, and so we, Christ is, is exactly who you need this morning. If you're lost, I point you to Christ. Amen. If you're cold and indifferent to the Word of God, I point you to Christ. If you need more praying power in your life, and every one of us do, I point you to Christ. Amen. He's the only answer.